So when we started this uh, course, going through Job, all those months ago, it was really these chapters that I was probably most excited to talk about. The first few are super exciting. The, the process, as we talked about, of, of moving through those, those middle chapters of suffering and argumentation, and I think there's a great deal, obviously, for us to learn um, in that. But clearly, getting to one of the few places in the Bible where God just lays out an entire speech right from the lips of God we might say, right from the mouth of God, is, is a pretty remarkable moment, right? Even in Scripture, right, as you think about what has been inscripturated, how frequent or how common is just an, an absolute soliloquy from God? Not common really at all, right? I mean, it's kind of interesting because it's part of what makes teaching the Old Testament so challenging, or I should say teaching the Old Testament appropriately so challenging, is because so frequently the Bible just records events and it doesn't interpret them. It doesn't tell you who's right and who's wrong. It oftentimes doesn't tell you if the person, what the person did was approved by God or, or uh, sin before God. And so that's why it's so frequent to get wildly different we call it interpretations about, uh, you know, the silly details of Scripture. And by silly details, I mean people trying to imbue certain details with meaning. For instance, a very common one is um, when uh, jo uh, Joshua, no, Joshua, no, Gideon, sorry, when Gideon is collecting his army, right, he gets all the people together and says, anybody who wants to can go home, and a bunch of people go home. And then he says, uh, God has him come by the water and says, hey, whoever laps up the water, you know, I think they're the ones that stay, and the ones who scoop the water with their hand, they go home, right? I think one way or the other. Anyway, so people will, pastors have tried to, like, draw a distinction between the lappers and the people who scoop, as if that's some kind of, but what is it really? It was just God trying to reduce the size of the army so that it would be very clear that it was he that beat the Midianites, right? So we can get dangerously far into kind of hyper-interpreting the details of Scripture rather than just saying, yeah, it's just what it was, right? No, no big, uh, you know, deeper meaning to every single uh, thing. So, and it's kind of like if anybody... I know we're probably not all big Star Wars fans here, so just bear with me. There were three amazing movies, Star Wars, A New Hope, and then there was The Return, or The Empire Strikes Back, and then there was the okayish Return of the Jedi, and those were lovely. And then there were these three terrible abominations before the current terrible abominations, where in, in which what they did stupidly was try to go back and explain every little detail and tie everything into, well, actually, this guy's the one who made C-3PO, and this is where, and it just was so mind-numbingly stupid that it destroyed the entire Star Wars franchise, and then they made it even worse in this last recent abomination. But the point is, is that we oftentimes will over- um, over explain, try to over detail out, try to make too many connections that really aren't there. So it's really nice when we finally get to hear the Lord just weigh in and, uh, and lay out what's going on. So one thing, and Henry Morris was the one to point this out, uh, that I think that God is leaning on heavily is something called the dominion mandate, right? The dominion mandate is the mandate which God gave man. When we look at our, our divine institutions, this is, uh, sometimes called the, the first divine institution of responsible dominion. Um, but would someone read Genesis 128? It's right on the front of your paper there, if you look here too. And God, and God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Great. And so, um, and then, interestingly, uh, well, we'll... we'll pop to Genesis 9 in a moment. So what is God doing when he gives this mandate to humankind, to man and woman? He's giving them a marching order. Yeah, he's giving them a marching order. I've created you to be positively related to this world. So even if sin had not entered the world, Adam and Eve would still spend their time growing, learning, figuring out how to take God's creation and what's encoded in God's creation and make it more fruitful, uh, spread the, the beauty of the Garden of Eden over the entire landmass of the earth, make the entire universe uh, organized, meaningful, and beautiful. 
right? Sin enters the world, thorns and thistles enter, death enters, decay enters, all that. But at the, uh, after the fall, or after the flood, rather, Genesis 9-1 repeats the mandate. We'll just get the first line of it. It says, so God blessed Noah and his sons. By the way, who are Noah and his sons? Who on earth today is a descendant of Noah and his sons? Every single one of us. So this is God's renewing of the dominion mandate. He changes the rules a little bit, but he says, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth. So that's still the goal is to be fruitful and multiply. And then he extends dominion to say, and also you can eat the animals. And things are going to change in that respect. So we see that they, uh, the changes are there, but the dominion mandate's the same. And it's really important, as we've had the pl- pleasure of hearing from uh, ICR scientists just this last weekend, uh, that it's important to recognize that God designed us to figure out his creation. God put all of this, and he designed us, again, even uh, irrespective of the fall, or if the fall hadn't happened, he designed us to grow to know and understand his creation better and better. How to maximize its efficiency, how to make it most fruitful, most beautiful, most reticent of his perfect, loving, amazing character, right? And so what we're going to note is that he's going to ask a whole bunch of questions and they will humble Job, right? As we'll see, they will put Job in his place, which is also our place before an eternal and all loving God. But also they're going to be challenging Job in his little part of the dominion mandate. He's going to ask him a bunch of questions about, have you figured out how this works? Have you figured out why? Have you figured out how this works? And as we look at this, um, he's, I think, Again, not an original idea. Henry Morris put, came up with this first, but he's challenging him to say, now, have you really done what you're meant to do with what I've given you to, to do? Have you really uh, uh, taken the dominion mandate seriously and figured out how the different elements of my creation work? Have you really figured out how uh, I designed you to be a steward over this earth? So that's an interesting portion of this, and that might inform the answer to this question, but bless you. But um, God never explains Job's suffering. He's going to go through this entire uh, four chapters here, 38, 39, 40, and 41, and he's going to not once address why Job's suffering, why he allowed that to happen, what good would come of it. He's not going to give Job what we'd call a single answer. Just for brief kind of pre-thinking, why do you think that is? Because it would have been as it wouldn't been a it wouldn't have been as much of a test if he knew the what he was being tested for. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. If if you're gonna tell someone, you know that you're gonna test them on their math skills or their algebra, right? They could go home that night and really study up for it. But if you really want to know how much they know, then you would sneak it up on them, right? They would find out how much is really there before, you know, without letting them cheat and cram a bunch of junk into their short-term memory. So yeah, I think that's a good observation. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts? I think the sovereignty he doesn't need to. Yeah. He doesn't need to. God doesn't owe us an explanation, not a super popular uh, opinion amongst humans. And we'll talk about that more. It's very important that we recognize that God doesn't owe us any kind of an explanation, right? Mm -hmm. In no way, if, if God explains, in no way, it looks like God is serving Job. Mm-hmm. And that's not the way it works. So. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so lots of great observations. And I think the other, uh, another point to this idea is that um, by revealing himself to Job and revealing Job's smallness, he... Uh, in essence, reminds Job that what we really are created for is to know and glorify God. And so he resets Job's and our, hopefully, perspective on life and go, oh, wait, we're not just here to have fun for a few years, suffer for a few years, and perish. We're here to glorify God eternally. Would would that be a, 
a mark against what you hear of, of this, of Job retaining everything again, everything getting back, getting back all his cattle, his family, and a new family, mm -hmm. and all that. I mean, wouldn't that kind of be out of the picture when we're talking about what God owes uh, Job? Mm -hmm. Well, and I do believe that in great part, we have to recognize why those things happen, which we'll get to when we get, uh, get to those chapters. But um, I would argue that the reason why God restores everything to Job is so that Job will be completely uh, redeemed. That is, his viewpoint will be completely uh, vindicated before man. Okay, but I only say that because you hear this all the time about this story, mm -hmm. that, it, that God was fair with him. Because, and you know, I, mean, I wonder when, I wonder if that's really the, the issue here, if God was fair. Yeah, I think you're right. It's not the issue. No. And, and it is definitely, if we were to walk away from Job saying, hey, the purpose is when you're going through suffering, that on the other side of it, you get back double, yeah. then you, we've missed the point of Job. That's a really excellent point. Mm -hmm. If we get to that, then we haven't truly understood or absorbed the message of Job. Um, again, I'd say that we'll, we'll discuss that and examine it more at the time, but I'd say that the reason why Job is restored is, again, to point out... Uh, to give concrete evidence that Job truly wasn't, didn't sin, he didn't fail, right? Um, but, but, but as far as, yeah, making some kind of promise or suggesting, again, it would be really self-defeating if it goes all this way to show that, um, that, it, that the purpose of serving God is not to get cool, win cool prizes. That the purpose of serving God is that we were designed to do. It's the only thing we're designed to do. And so if we were to come back and allow the end of the book to belie that, then we'd really, well, we'd really have missed something, won't we? Wouldn't we have? Um, so great point. Good. Well, now that we got thinking that way, um, we will begin by, uh, let's see, let's start with Finn. Will you start by reading for us uh, chapter 38, 1 through 3? Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this who darkens, who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. Cool. So, um, a couple fun little details or, or interesting points along the way. Uh, it says, the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said... Now this is kind of fascinating because... Uh, Certain interpreters who want to see Elihu as the problem suggest that this is directed towards Elihu, this who, who is this who darkens counsel. But it doesn't say that. It says that he's addressing Job. So um, it seems a bit linguistically unfair to suggest that he's questioning Elihu by this. It seems like he's going back to take, bringing the focus on Job, and truly Job is going to be the focus of this entire speech. So I'm not sure quite the motivation other than the desire, that kind of dedicated desire to see everyone in Job's circumstances as bad. And we've seen that you could interpret, or there's some challenges to Elihu's speech, but by and large, I'd stand by the fact that Elihu was actually giving really good, godly perspective. Um, so he comes out and he says, who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? So Job is finally getting an assessment from God. What is, what is he... Uh, what is God's assessment of all of his words? And we could argue it's for all him and all of his friends. There, there wasn't a lot of wisdom in his words? Yeah. It seems as if, and, and we could argue, again, obviously this is given by God's uh, providence for our benefit, but at the same time, I think we could argue with some security that all of the arguments between chapter 3 and this point have all been less edifying than not. Yeah. And it's kind of interesting because uh, we, especially, how many of us are verbal processors versus internal processors? How many of us like to process things by talking about them? No verbal processors at the table? Just me and Cadence? Sometimes. Some, yeah, sometimes we process verbally, right? It helps us to, that's why it's good to have friends and counselors because they can help you, like, talk it through. If that's the way you operate, especially. Well, so a lot of this has been processing verbally, right? And it's just 
been problematic because so many of their human um, theological presuppositions that are wrong, right, have, have worked their way into the discussion. Is it possible when God was speaking to Job that others were hearing, or do you think this was just directly to Job himself? Well, uh, as we'll talk about in a moment, the, this is out of the whirlwind, so I think everybody's there. Everybody who had the courage not to flee was was there hearing this. Now, could it be that everyone, someone, uh, I think it was McGee, said he thought everybody ran away, and this was just Job and God time. But I would argue that whatever's going on with this whirlwind, whatever's going on with this storm, that everybody's still present, right, and getting uh, information from this. Uh, again, we just have to assume uh, or have to guess or say that we don't know. Uh, but one thing I, I would like to make abundantly clear is that there's a lot of times where more talking doesn't do any good. There's just great moments. In fact, there's so many great moments to just be quiet. And there comes a point when we're going, especially when we're going through struggling, that uh, perhaps, again, especially if you're, who you're talking to is not sympathetic, is not spurring you on towards Christ, then it can be a great thing to say, you know what, I'm tired. I'm going to go, right? And as we saw, the, as these different speeches kind of ping-ponged back and forth, they got hotter, they got meaner, they got louder, they got hotter, they got meaner, they got louder, until people were saying things that they probably really regretted. Well, Job's friends certainly regretted, and it's argued Job did too. And I wonder if Job was wondering, man, you know, if I had just kept my head down, if I just hadn't opened my mouth, then this would be a very different meeting with God. Because I I would guess that the meeting with God would still occur. And how wonderful would it be to meet, uh, meet with the Lord having not you know, uh, hurled quite as much audacity into the wind. So, first of all, we say it's the Lord that answered Job. I I, I hope and presume everyone has the Lord in those uh, small uppercase letters. Yeah, this is Yahweh. This is the covenant name of God. Yeah, like uh, you see the words L-O-R-D, and it's like in uppercases, but they're kind of like smaller than normal uppercases. Oh, Oh, I see. Yeah, it's a weird, it's a convent, no, no, it's okay. It's a, it is a, yeah, it's a difficult thing to explain. I mean, in terms of like, okay, they're small, they're uppercase letters, but they're smaller than normal ones. Anyway, the, uh, the point being, this is uh, how, it's kind of a modern tradition going all the way back to Israel. Now, if you go pre-David, or pre-fall, or sorry, pre-Babylonian captivity, the name Yahweh was regularly written, and spoken and used, right? So they would talk because when the, the people asked, who is your God? They wouldn't say, well, God is our God because that would be a meaningless statement. They would say, Yahweh is our God. Yahweh was the distinction against, you know, Dagon or Baal or Ashtoreth or all the other gods and goddesses of the pantheon. They'd say, no, 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 Yahweh is our God. Our God is one. He is the God above all gods. Uh, And so they're very specific about that. Now, after you get back from the Babylonian captivity with Ezra and the, the foundation of like the Pharisees and specifically the Pharisees, uh, they started taking seriously certain aspects of God's law that were not actually God's law. They were tradition, right? So when they saw, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, right? They said, well, how could we know what's taking it in vain? And so the difficulty with that was, well, you could be reading Scripture but not be paying attention. Maybe that would be taking it in vain. So what they did is they took the covenant name Yahweh out of Scripture and they replaced it with Adonai or Lord. Okay. So then, and, and to this day, in fact, the Jews you will never convince them to connect. And so you got like Jehovah, which is sort of an Anglish Anglicization, Anglicization of of Yahweh, but. They'll never use the name of God, in fact, by, by saying Yahweh or something to that effect in Jewish culture of the New Testament era, you could have been stoned for it because they'd say, you said it in vain. Now, it's a really important point that when God said, thou shalt not use my name in vain, he was not talking. So this is where we get our modern tradition of not saying things like, oh my God, right? This is, that we're, we're porting that idea over that God means the God of the Bible all the time. I'm not suggesting we pick up the nasty habit of saying, oh my God, all the time, or whatever God-based slanders, slurs, or swears we can fit into our... But the point is, that's not really what 
taking God's name in vain is. Taking God's, that is Yahweh's name in vain, is attaching to him or slandering his character un, his, is ungodly or false or treating him like one of the uh, pagan gods and goddesses of the time. So that's the idea of not taking his name in vain. It's not saying, you know, things we could say like, you know, uh, for the priests of that time saying Yahweh, uh, wants you to give us this kind of meat, not that kind of meat, right? Which priests were killed for that by God, uh, for that sorts, those sorts of behaviors, right? By incorrectly administering the faith of the Old Testament to the people, they were misrepresenting Yahweh, they were taking God's name in vain. So it's not just a, a flippant verbal speech, although our speech is important, it's talking about a bigger deal there. And, and so what happened, tragically, as you get into the post- uh, Babylonian captivity time period is that the people of Israel were separated from the very name of their God. They weren't allowed to pronounce, and so that kind of depersonalized the God of the Bible. They were no longer uh, personally related to Yahweh or Jehovah. They were related to the Hashem, the name, or Adonai, the Lord. And those were terms that could have been used for any god or goddess. So you just had to know kind of by context what that meant. So anyway, it's really fascinating here that if, if we believe that this is written as early as I believe it is, that this would be uh, one of the early uh, revelations that God went by Jehovah. God went by Yahweh. He personally is appearing here. This isn't the angel of the Lord. This isn't uh, some other emanation. This is a direct uh, bot call. This is a Shekinah glory. This is an appearance of God on earth. When we, when we speak of Yahweh, <clears throat> are, we, are we in essence uh, talking about the, the uh, Trinity, the three parts of, of God? I, I think mean, this, is, this is never revealed in the Old Testament, right? Ever? No, I, yeah. Hmm. I would say that Yahweh is probably an epithet that more attaches to God the Father, but yeah, it is the whole, it is definitely entirely Trinitarian. And the reason I would say that is, is Psalm 110, which says, the Lord, Yahweh, says to my Lord, Adonai, uh, sit at my right hand, right? So who is Yahweh in that situation? Well, it's God the Father, who's my Adonai, my, my Lord. It's well, Jesus isn't Christ. It, isn't it in the plural, or, or some name in the Old Testament of God is Plural. Elohim is Elohim is plural, mm -hmm. Elohim is plural absolutely. Um, so there's that definitely that symbol signal of uh, plurality and unity um, is always a part of it too. So uh, yeah, so there's there's a lot of wonderful complication. But I think what's really valuable here is imagine, just pretend that you had some kind of an issue with the president. You know, just try to imagine, pretend that, that you had something you might want to say to the president. And so then let's pretend that you tweeted it now that you would be allowed to tweet it. You had tweeted your complaint against the president, right? How would it be, what would happen if, what would you think would happen if you all of a sudden heard a knock at your door and there was the president coming to answer your question? Now, no matter... No matter whether you thought he could remember his name under those circumstances or not, is totally immaterial. The point that, and it's, it's kind of, it's funny, it was during a previous, uh, a previous president, I remember someone saying, well, if I got to talk to that guy, I'd give him what for, and I thought, no, you probably wouldn't. I mean, you would probably have a decent amount of respect for the office and for the situation, and you probably wouldn't say, at least in the way you're pretending to say them in your living room, right? So, uh, I don't, uh, I don't mean to get unnecessarily political. I only want to point out the, 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 the magnitude of this event of God himself personally showing up, the Shekinah glory, and he shows up in this whirlwind. What's that? Nothing. Okay. He shows up in a whirlwind. So what a uh, whirlwind is, it's actually like a big storm or maybe even a windstorm. So we've talked about how as, as Elihu's speaking, he's almost like prophetically making these little notices uh, that the storm is brewing, the storm is coming up, the winds are blowing, it's starting to get nasty out, and all of a sudden the storm in some way like materializes right before them and comes uncomfortably close seemingly so that they could hear it. What, uh, when we think of a storm, uh, what sorts of 
things come to mind, particularly a whirlwind. Tornadoes. What's that? Tornadoes. Tornadoes, yep. Big tornadoes. Noise. noise, lots of noise. Big danger. danger. Huge danger, right? Mm -hmm. And when you've got a major, major storm going up, what button can you press or what can you throw into the air or what words can you say to make it stop? Nothing. With all that the, that we've got, I think there was a oh there was a brilliant movie called. I think I have an app for that, actually. Yeah, the, yeah, the the weather app, right? <laughs> Just the change the weather app, right? It was a brilliant movie called Sharknado that was made, and there was a tornado filled with sharks that was ravaging a coastal town, and um, by dropping a bomb in the middle of the tornado, they were able to stop the tornado filled with sharks. Meanwhile, also blowing up all the sharks. It was a brilliant move and very bravely executed by the men and women of Sharknado. But the truth of the matter is, is that anything of that magnitude, whether it's a hurricane or a tornado, is totally outside of our control. And so God's appearance inside the tornado is to point out, or inside this whirlwind or this storm, is to point out what you can't control. I can control so much that I can manifest myself in. I bring it about, I control it, I'm going to keep it from destroying you, and it's just an absolute symbol of his power and his ability to take presence here. I mean, he's, he appears in other ways, right? Sometimes he shows up as the angel of the Lord, that's the pre-incarnate Christ. When he showed up to Moses, he showed up as the burning bush, yep, the fire of the burning bush. He showed up before the children of Israel in a pillar of, of uh, fire and a pillar of smoke, right? He showed up in many, revealed himself in many forms. But this is probably one of the most dramatic, arguably. Um, and it seems as if, I, I think I put it here, that it's just, it's a power move. You know? Like, it's just an absolute power move. They say that the old kings and uh, kings would, you know, if they had a, a, a powerful enemy that they destroyed, that they destroyed, that they defeated, uh, that they would take the king of that country or whatever and make him serve under him. Sometimes, it, you know, cutting off his thumbs and big toes to, to absolutely debilitate him. But it was a powerful thing to do. So this powerful person, I destroyed. I kicked him. I beat him. And so God is showing up here in the storm saying, hey, here's something that's totally, you can't bring rain when you want it and you can't stop a storm when it's coming. So it was the, he was the storm. Okay. I mean, he didn't visibly appear in the storm. He was the storm. Okay. I, I think there's some semantic to that that I might because be missing. Himself, right. Because he's God the Father, and he has no visible form in that sense. So, yeah, you could say that, I mean, I'm, I, I guess I would argue, like, he appeared through the form, through the storm. Okay. But that would be very semantic, yes. Ultimately, there was no, like human form within the storm, so as far as we're told. I was, I was trying to visualize, visualize that too. Is it just like, I'm picturing like an hurricane, and you just hear his voice then? Or you don't, yeah, you don't actually see like a physical image, like a body. Yeah, yeah that's how I would, because it says he answered Job out of the whirlwind. Yeah. So you get the sense that there's this big kind of weather event going on, however uncomfortable it is to be near it, and then God's booming voice comes over it, comes through it. it very much so. Yeah. Huge, overwhelming, like physically overwhelming of it. Um, and again, I think that's fascinating when we think about, this is arguably angelic rather than God himself, but when you get Elijah, right? There's these huge storms and th earthquakes and all the other thing, and what does God, how does God finally appear to, to Isaiah? Or Isaiah, is it... Uh, Elijah, sorry. In the still small voice, right? He comes in that way to Elijah, presumably because Elijah is pretty defeated and humbled and hopeless. And so here he comes to Elijah in this small, approachable, still small voice. And now the Job, for whatever reason, needs seems to need to understand something about God's majesty and sovereignty in showing up in this whirlwind. So, um, so there we go. He is a who who darkens the counsel of the words so he basically uh tells job hey you don't know what you're talking about and i'm about to tell you why if that's fair now prepare yourself like a man this is fantastic prepare yourself like a man is uh translating a hebrew euphemism that's like even used in the new testament which is gird up the loins of your gird up your loins 
So uh, you imagine, the, again, these oriental dress at that time would have been um, large robes and long robes. So if you had to do anything action oriented, that like you were gonna get in a fight or whatever, you know, like if we thought we were coming up on an altercation, I might take off my glasses because I know that something's about to happen, right? It's a little bit like that. He's saying, be ready, like brace yourself, gird up your loins. So what they would do is they would take the uh, the longer part of the robes and wrap them up and tie them and attach them around in a belt in their waist so that their legs would be free to move freely, right? Um, he's telling Job to prepare himself or really prepare to defend yourself like a man. He says, I will question you and you shall answer me. Now, this is a pretty interesting approach because, again, well, remember, Job's been through it, right? I mean, having been through it like Job, I think we could say that we can all appreciate his questions and his wonderings and his current concerns and his sorrow. Um, and yet here in this time, it seems like God doesn't think he needs a hug and a kiss, you know, and to be put to bed, don't worry, honey, I'm going to make it all better. Even though God is going to make it all better, this seems to be a tough love situation. Why is this a tough love situation? Why would God come in like this? Job is thoroughly broken. Well, but, um, my commentary says that God does not humiliate or condemn him, condemn Job. Is that true? Do you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, it's a tough love, but but he doesn't. He's not doing that. Okay. Yeah, he's certainly not going to, he's not humiliating him at all, but he is bringing Job to the same thing that Elihu, I think, was trying to bring Job to, which is to recognize, whatever the case, you don't stand before God. Uh, there's a wonderful essay that we've referenced before called God in the Dock by C.S. Lewis, and essentially the dock is the, uh, wit or the, the, the stand of accusation where the accused sits. They sit in the dock and they get questioned and quizzed or whatever it is, you know, examined, examined to find out if they're, uh, if they're guilty or if they're innocent. And C.S. Lewis points out in that essay uh, that essentially the world today believes, our postmodern world believes that God is in the dock. God is in the accused stand, and he has to answer our questions. Why is there wickedness in the world? Why did you, a good God, allow suffering? God, why are you allowing this? Why did you let my mom get sick? Why did you let my, why did you? And, and you know, the modern world might even be respectful and let God give his answers and evaluate them and decide if he's a good God or not, if he's worthy of existence or worthy of our praise. But the problem is, as C.S. Lewis points out, that the true question that we need to be asking is not, if God exists, what do I make of him? But rather, if God exists, the pertinent question is, what does he make of me? It doesn't matter whether I approve of God or not. It doesn't matter if God meets my standard of what I'd want God to be or wish God would be. It only matters what he, the creator, thinks of me. In other words, we're accountable to him, never the other way around. And so it's one of the big problems that we get when I'm sure we've all had this opportunity. You're sharing the faith or sharing the gospel, whatever it is, you're talking to someone about faith and they say, you know, but God killed all those people in the Old Testament. You know, Joshua, they went through and they killed whole towns. And you know, I don't know if I'd like a God who does that. And you, as much as I don't want us to be insensitive, do you know what the correct answer is to that question? Or what's maybe a correct answer to that, that accusation or question? No, no, it, it will be offensive. It will be. The answer is offensive. We don't get to make the rules. Yeah, and his being, he's beyond our comprehension. We don't get to make the rules. Mm -hmm. He's the potter and you're the pot. Right. That is the correct answer. Now, we can talk about why God wiped out those whole cities of men, women, and children, sometimes even all livestock. We can talk about why, what reasons we might attach to that or even very con we can be very confident about. But at the end of the day, we need to, that, if that ever comes up and we're talking about the faith, we need to, it's a great opportunity to stop and say, remember, you don't get to tell God or judge God in what is good or bad. God judges us in what is good or bad.
And we would note that while there were, we could argue that it was a quasi-genocide that God ordered in that situation, it was only when it was a God-ordered act that it is ever permitted or permissible, right? That's not a continuing or continual command of God. That is a one-time only clearing out the Holy Land thing. And so we recognize, we want to make sure that we make them realize like, yeah, there is no uh, biblical cause for violence against, or call for violence as believers against non-believers. That's a complete anti-biblical way of thinking. However, in that one instance, the one time when God did, or in the times when God did do that, we have to recognize that we're, it's not our place to judge God. We don't have the authority to do so. So it's, it's actually a very powerful moment in our witnessing when we can finally help someone understand you shouldn't be just sitting here lackadaisically and intellectually considering the possibility of a god you should be on bended knee shaking in your boots for the possibility that if god exists and you don't meet his standard you're going to hell this isn't just a casual fun coffee talk you know for for a a pseudo intellectual saturday night it's a big deal. And, and so what Job is being reminded of here, I would say very strongly, is that, hey, you were, you're Job. Literally, by scriptural testimony, the mo- one of the most godly men to ever live. And yet even he had not fully gotten to this point of realizing, it prior to this chapter, of realizing that God is God, and you don't get to question what he does. We can ask him questions because he's loving and because he's approachable, but we don't get to demand that we're owed his attention or owed his, um, his uh, explanation for things, just as the president doesn't owe us individually or personally an explanation, right? We could argue it's a different form of government with the whole democracy thing, but by and large, once the president is the president, he doesn't owe us an explanation for the things that he does as president president in that session, in that sense. And uh, that's only a microcosm of the ultimate reality that God is beyond us. He outranks us, right? So that's part one of the answer before he even opens, he even starts to answer. He's already setting this up to say, Job, you don't ask me questions. But if you want to get into the situation, I'm the one who asks the questions. And then he starts the questions. Um, John, would you mind reading for us verses 4 through 7? Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand who marked off its dimensions. Surely you know who stretched a measuring line across it. On what were its footings set or who laid its cornerstone while the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy. Outstanding. So lots of fun in this. First of all, we have this picture of laying the foundation. So what's that, what's that drawing on? Yeah. What's the image, though, that it's pulling? What's that? Capstones. Capstones? Yeah, stones. and We're kind of floating around it, but building a building, right? He's, he's referring to the earth as a, as a building. He's saying, where were you when I laid the foundations? Where were you when I started this thing? Now, this is a fascinating deal because when we build a house, what do we do? Dig down to bedrock, start putting foundation stones down and building off that solid ground. That's what gives the building its... Um, strength or its durability, whatever we want to say, right? Um, fascinatingly, we've already seen in Job 26, 7, and this is Job speaking, he says, he stretches out the north over empty space. He hangs the earth on nothing. So here is amazing information that, um, that the, the, came by revelation, surely, that the, that the world's not sitting on the back of a turtle. It's not built on a ball. It's not a flat earth. Here it is. It's suspended in the middle of nothing. I mean, just imagine that. I, I think it's hard for us to think about the more we ponder space and the great, incredible, you know, inky blackness of space as it goes. And we're just only uh, seemingly holding together by the laws of gravity in relationship to all the various other uh, heavenly or, you know, planets and so forth. And yet, somehow, that foundation was laid. It sounds like a tricky foundation to lay, doesn't it? He's hanging it all on nothing. Do you guys ever um, 
play that game where you, you're just like kaplink or whatever it was, where you're like removing things from a balancing. Kerplunk. Kerplunk, is that what, that's the one. Or you're, you're doing these kind of fun little things. Well, he is quite literally, you know, as you hang those various deals or place the, the pieces or chips on the balancing board, trying to keep it uh, balanced. He literally balanced all these planets together and stars together. And we don't even think about it for a moment, but if the world were the chaotic mess that the evolutionists and the atheists thought it was, then it is unthinkable that the world wouldn't have been destroyed by asteroids or some kind of I don't know, galaxian fecal matter or something, and just races over a thousand times, but what? That's never happened. Isn't that something? In fact, God has designed so many systems to keep us even protected from that between the moon and the other planets that seem to draw off any kind of space debris that would be damaging to us. We are so perfectly protected. Everything is so perfectly hangs together, and God's asking Job, come on, tell me. Right? Let's go back to Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Where were you when I laid that foundation? And, of course, the answer is there. You, you weren't there. He stretched out the line upon it and that where, uh, its foundation, or where its foundations fastened, who laid its cornerstone. When the co- morning stars, now here's the other fun part for tonight. Uh, when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. So we learn a couple things. What do, what do we see the sons of God? We, we know that phrase. That's the angelic world, right? Yeah. Yep, the angelic world. So you've got all of the angels, and they're being equated here with the morning stars, which is fascinating because that uh, relates it to at least the middle of the creation week. But it is really cool here. It says all the sons of God shouted for joy, right? So this tells us a whole bunch of information. One, angelic creation had to be before creation week, right? Furthermore, in the midst of the creation week, they are all shouting for joy, which means that they couldn't have fallen at this point. So there was an unfallen, and so what this means is that Satan could not have really fallen outside of reference to time. There had to be a point in creation where Satan was, and and all the fallen angels were actually all on point with them together and they're all singing for joy they're all responding positively which gives us a really important point because where's our other sons of god reference well our other sons of god references in the first well other places but in job is at the beginning and we see that satan is all of a sudden in a state of rebelliousness but we see from this verse that he was not created in a state of rebelliousness nor was he um you know forced into it or he wasn't some some being or God external to the system. He's one of the sons of God, and now he's in a state of rebellion, right? So kind of kind of cool that all that is pointed out right in the context of this, that the, um, the sons of God were there uh, watching already uh, during the creation program. Um, so pretty cool stuff already. They all sang together, uh, blah, 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 blah. Okay, 8 through 11. April, would you? For who shut in the sea with doors when it burst forth and issued from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling bin? When I fixed my limit for it and set bars and doors? When I said, this far you may come, but no farther. And here your proud waves must stop. Okay. Now, you're going to have to ride with me on this one. This is another Henry Morris classic. And I believe that what he's talking here is not just the fact that God creates the water cycle, he did, but also that he's looking to the flood, right? He's walked, he's walked, he's kind of going to be constantly referencing creation, as we said, the dominion mandate, and this huge flood judgment, right? All these, all these events are getting pulled together, and it's really cool to think if we just read these very casually and superficially, we might miss this, but he is referencing, we're going to see Everything that Job was meant to be aware of based on God's revelation of how we came to exist. In other words, understanding creation, understanding Genesis 1 through 11 is critical. It's pivotal to our understanding of God, of his character, of his right demands and expectations, of the divine institutions. It's all there. And he's throwing back on that, on those events. So he says, who shut the sea with the doors when it burst forth 
and issued from the womb. Now, this idea of the sea bursting forth and issuing from a womb is, it's, it's birth imagery, right? So um, we've got the whole water breaking event and then the child you know, comes forth. It's this idea uh, is, is in view that God had contained the water on earth. The clouds are like a garment. And then uh, would someone be so kind as to read Genesis 7? It's on page 2. Genesis 7, 11 through 12. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, on that day all the fountains of the great deep were broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened, and the rain was on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. Excellent. So uh, whether this these fountains of the deep that were broken up uh, it's quite a mysterious statement indeed there's lots of different theories about how to work it but however it is somehow water broke forth and became un unmanageable by man upon the earth right this idea this picture of the skies and the earth bursting forth with all this water was a sign of hey do you remember that time and we're not that many generations after the flood, mind you. So they remembered that time. I mean, I wasn't anywhere. I wasn't even a thought when Kennedy was assassinated. But I know that that was an important event. And that was, you know, just not even a, gen a generation before me. The moon landing or the Bolshevik Revolution, right? There are certain events that are huge that, that even though we might not have lived through them, they m remain in the conscience. Well, do you think when God wiped everybody out in this huge worldwide flood that it was a memorable event that got passed down? We know for a fact it has, not just from the scriptural record, but from all the other flood myths and legends and ideas that have spread throughout all the earth. So God is a, a, alluding to this. He says, where were you when I burst forth and flooded this earth? And why did he flood it? Why did God flood the earth? What's it? For judgment. For judgment, yeah. Because... Man, all of his thoughts were sinful all the time. In other words, all of humanity in the antediluvian world got to the point where nobody could even think a godly thought. And we can sympathize with that in America, right? It was a, there was a time not that long ago that a person standing on the street corner sh sharing gospel tracts would have people honestly saying, I do want to know how to get closer to God. I, yes, I do. Tell me how to know Jesus. What kind of treatment do you get if you were to do something like that today? What's that? Anger. La if you're lucky, you'll just get mocked. It would not surprise me at any day to, to hear about physical violence against someone who was out on the streets. And the worst part is the world would justify it. The world would celebrate it. They beat up another Christian. Praise God. That's where we're at. We're coming close to the point, and I'm not trying to be a doomsday or naysayer or whatever it is, but I think we're coming ever closer to the point where it is going to be considered unacceptable to speak forth biblical truth in the public sphere. If we're not already there, we're headed to the point where it's dangerously so. So what happened on the earth? Finally, that ring closed, and it was impossible for God to save anyone in that situation anymore. So what did he do? It needed a wipeout. He wiped it all out because that's how far it gotten that only Noah was uh, walked with God. It doesn't even really say that his family did as well. They were just along for the ride because they had a good, they had the right dad. I'm sure by the time the water started to fall, they straightened out their viewpoints if they hadn't. So it's not clear to me in 8 through 11 whether this, he's referring to what happened at creation or after the flood? Did he, you know, he set limits on the sea and told it how far it could go and all of that. Did, that happened when he created the earth and then also after the flood. That's true. Yep. I think the, uh, I think the statement of, uh, first of all, the release, because in the creation he didn't release the water. He just, it was there. So I think the statements of release that it burst forth and issued from the womb uh, and then the, the reference to the clouds pouring forth um, or the clouds being a part of that, that thing. So this would, this would have been after the flood. So then after the flood, we get the second side of this, which is um, 
yeah, I, when I fixed my limit for it and set bars and doors, when I said, this far you may come, but no farther, here stop your proud way, or here your proud ways and stop. I think that's a reference to uh, Genesis 8, 13 through 14. It says, and it came to pass in the 600 year, 601st year, on the first month of the first day of the month, that the waters were dried up from the earth, and Noah removed the covering from the ark and looked, and indeed the surface of the ground was dry. In the second month, in the 27th day of the month, the earth was dried. So, um, again, this is poet, poetry for sure. It's possible that he's not talking about this, about the flood event. It just feels right. I mean, again, it was so recent for Job, just like we talked about the storm. Um, however, it, it could absolutely be the creation event at all, in which case God is just saying, I'm in charge of water, and you're not, which is also absolutely true and is implicit in the statement regardless so what do you think he means when he says wrapped it in thick darkness like wrapped the earth in thick darkness or in verse 9 or wrapped yeah. what do you think that's about? and thick darkness it's, it's swaddling band I mean it, it could well be a reference to the storms of the flood period uh, that it became didn't know maybe it was Genesis 1, 2, where it's talking about the earth is formless and the sea is darkness. You don't the water, no, that, I think that. There, I always was confused by that verse in verse 2 of Genesis yeah. 1 about why it was the earth dark and formless and void. Mm -hmm. yeah. I didn't know if that was possibly a correlation or not. It certainly, uh, it certainly could be. I would argue that, again, the... The context of it seems to be that he's moving from creation to the fall, and we're going to see there's more evidence of that in a moment. But, um, we'll, yeah, we'll leave that there. He, the point being, he's the one who made it so that the, the waves would stop on the land, right? Now, interestingly, does that mean that the, there will never be flooding on the earth after that? No, there still are floods, right? Do, is there, I mean, great tsunamis that come and overtake you? Of course there are, right? But by and large, this is the, the context that, like, now all of a sudden, we don't need to worry about a worldwide flood again, no matter what, whatever the Hollywood movies say. Or, yeah, we're safe on that. So, who are we to? Joy, would you pick up at 12 through 18, I think it is? Through 18? Mm hmm Have you ever given orders to the morning or shown the dawn its place? that it might take the earth by the edges and shake the wicked out of it. The earth takes shape like clay under a seal. It features, its features stand out like those of a garment. The wicked are denied their light, and their upraised arm is broken. Have you journeyed to the springs of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been shown to you? Have you seen the gates of the deepest darkness? Have you comprehended the vast expanses of the earth? Tell me if you know all this. Outstanding. So, uh, so here we've got uh, God's authority over earth systems, right? So if we go back to that beginning, it says, God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. There are those who try to, again, we talked about over-interpreting. They try to put a huge spiritual emphasis on this as if the night was evil and the light was day. But it's just, it's kind of reaching to me. Just a little bit of a reach, because day and night persist, right? He was, it's talking about the origins of uh, systems that we still see going on today, right? So uh, he's pointing out that in the uh, verse 14 of Genesis 1 says, Then God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night, and let there be signs and seasons for days and years. Let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. Uh, God made the two lights and so on, the sun and the moon. So here he is talking about the sun and the moon and all the uh, the lights and pointing out has has this been revealed to you job do you know where the sun goes where when you can't see it do you know how this system works right he's continually and it, it's fascinating because now we live in this time where we have fulfilled more of the dominion mandate we know more about how God designed the systems and the sun and the rotation and the star all that business right we know more about it which is great now, the question is, is it's really fascinating, is, as it's turned, science is, sci, uh, the scientific method, our observation, our learning, however you want to talk about it, has discovered things about 
how the world functions. And fascinatingly, as one uh, sad person in hell now, uh, now once said uh, to the, actually Stephen Hawking said to the Pope, because of our scientific uh, discoveries, we no longer need your God. Now, isn't that fascinating? Because, because he thought because we figured out how the earth you know, is, spins around the sun and how the other planets work, that all of a sudden there was no need for God anymore. Well, who hung it there, Buster? <laughs> who invented the force of gravity that it would do as such? I mean, the audacity and stupidity of that statement, just because we can observe and learn more about what God has done or is doing or how he's uh, made these systems to work, it doesn't make us master over them. It just means that we figured out the, we might say, the riddle that God has encoded. But it's fascinating that uh, we all get rather sophomoric, rather easy. We got into that idea that, well, I know a little something about that, and therefore, what? With, I'm an expert, yeah. Or we could have done it. Like, wait a minute, no, we couldn't have done it, right? Have you ever um, had someone tell you the end of a mystery, like a mystery movie or a murder mystery, and you're watching it, and you, you know the end? So you, feel, you could feel terribly clever, you know, because you know the end and you're seeing all the things come together. Like, okay, well, that's the bad guy. Oh, she killed her. Oh, whatever it is, right? But that didn't mean you write the, wrote the story. It just means that you'd been figured out the information necessary like, to, to, to figure it out early. It's not the same thing as writing the story. It's not the same thing as creating theory. Exactly. I mean, this guy Steve Hawking, mm -hmm. yeah. great physicist. They haven't figured that out in science yet. Yeah, exactly. It goes back to the old joke about the, the scientist who comes to God and says, God, we've got it. We can, we can create life. We no longer need you. We can create life. We, we can do it. And, uh, and, and God says, all right, well, you create life and I'll create life, and we'll see whose life is better. And the uh, scientist stoops down to grab a fistful of dirt, and he says, oh, actually, no, you've got to make your own dirt. <laughs> and that's the point. All we can figure out to do is rearrange the stuff that he's already made and given. So even if we could create life in a laboratory, what difference would that make as to the absolute necessity of God to make it in the first place? I'm not predicting that we will ever make life in a laboratory in the, in the purest sense of the word. But the point uh, being that, that even as we do understand more, and we're meant to, we're supposed to, God designed us in his image so that we would, that that doesn't mean that we've created it or invented it. It doesn't mean that we have authority over it. It just means we know more about what God's doing. That's why all the greatest scientists, that's why, one, why science, by and large, came out of the Western tradition. It didn't come out of the lupus, loop, loopy-minded Eastern tradition of constant circles and cycles that never end and never go anywhere. It didn't come from that idiocy. It came from the Western world that believed that there's a God who created the world with a direction and a purpose in which sin had entered and which we could come to a meaningful understanding of his creation and thus solve some of the problems and lighten some of our burden. It didn't come out of Africa. It didn't come out of South American, Native American uh, ideologies. Those were all tragically darkened by sin. But the Western tradition had one advantage, and that is that the biblical message, the biblical worldview had come through it. And so they had a reason to search because they believed that there was a, a, a source out there, God, who'd put sense and order and logic and reason into it all. And if we could figure it out, we could unlock some of the mysteries and maybe live better. It's really powerful importance because tragically that same tradition has turned on its roots and tried to say that, you know, that we're uh, equal to or we are the creators, and that's, of course, folly. But um, with that, we pick up at 19 through 21. Uh, whose turn is it? Brian? Yeah. Where is the way to the dwelling of light? In darkness, where is its place? that you may take it to its territory, and that you may discern the path to its home. You know, for you were born then, and the number of your days is great. Awesome. So, obviously the stinging sarcasm, you know, because you were born then. <laughs> Keep in mind, you were born, right? God, the infinite being, who had no beginning or end, he was not created nor born. But, but Job, you had a beginning. You had to, like, fuzz into con. Uh, contact with the nature of reality. Uh, it's a, another great scientific fact that we totally take for granted, but that light 
is a wave, a particle. John, looking at you here. What is light? Well, they're different models depending on what you're trying to demonstrate. Right. So is it fair to say there's still an element of mystery in it? I, I would say so. Yeah. I think they classify it as waves. Though. Waves? They get, so, and I think that's what John was saying, that depending on what you're trying to work with, how you're trying to work with light. But fascinatingly, we know that you can't, at least I, I, as far as I'm concerned, I, I'm aware, you can't catch light in a bottle and then like open it up later and then let that light out. But it's constantly moving and bouncing off things. It's just a pretty remarkable uh, thing. And God points out the absolute mystery and the nature of light and fascinatingly seems to speak of it accurately because he talks about it moving through paths, going a direction, uh, going to a place. And um, he's saying, do you know it because, or sorry, uh, that you may know the paths to its home. So, um, we, it's, it's fascinating considering that God created light and darkness before, or light rather, uh, before he uh, created the sources of light, the sun and the moon, or the sun particularly, but in particular. But we look at this and see that God is already communicating about light in a way that we're still struggling to understand that it's, it moves, that it goes somewhere. It's not uh, static, right? And, and that darkness is just the absence of light. So, um, uh, 22 through 30. Uh, Doug, would you mind? You have entered the storehouses of the snow, or have you seen the storehouses of the hail, which I reserve for the time of distress, for the day of war and battle? Through what? 30. Okay. <clears throat> Where is the way? Where is the way that the light is divided, or the east wind scattered on the earth? Who has cleft a channel for their flood, or a way for the thunderbolt to bring rain on a land without people, on a desert without a man in it, to satisfy the waste and desolate land, to make the seed of grass to sprout? Has the rain a father? Or who has begotten the drops of dew? For those for whose womb has come the ice and the frost of heaven, who has given it birth? The water becomes hard as stone, and the surface of the deep is in prison. All right. Now, we're roughly in the Middle East, right? As we've seen. I know I don't have my map to pull up here. We're in the Middle East. If you're imagining yourself in the middle of that area, right? How much snow would you think you'd see today? Zero. Zero. Right? Because it's a desert wasteland. It's real hot all the time. Now, we have no record or no mention of any of these. They're not saying, and far way up in Russia, you might see snow. These guys, God here is referencing snow to them as something that they would see commonly and they would see regularly. So here's another fascinating reality about, uh, well, true climate true climate change. <laughs> and that's that the climate changes because sin entered the world. And so after the flood, there was a, a single massive ice age. And because we're misinformed about ice ages, we think that means that pole to pole, world, the whole world is covered in ice, but that's not an ice age. In fact, we see that the larger uh, ice in the top and then the band of survivable, the survivable world was still basically equatorial. But even in the equatorial band of livable, the livable post-flood world, it was still getting regular cold, so much so that snow and hail are following with regularity, and so much so that their bodies of water are icing over. Pretty remarkable amount of detail, isn't it? Pretty amazing to think that someone, some hundreds of years later who'd never seen snow, would imagine this or make this up. It'd be a pretty fantastic amount of imagination indeed for them to, uh, again, invent snow and ice for themselves when they'd never seen it, right? 
It's a pretty remarkable thing. So this stands absolutely in line with what we see with creation science. After the flood, we see an ice age that reduces. In fact, also we see why there was such mass extinction after the flood. So many, uh, like dinosaurs and other creatures, would have gotten on the, on, on the boat, on the ark, and gotten off the ark. But what did they come out to? They came out to a world much more harsh and less inviting than the one they had. So there wasn't the plant life around for these dinosaurs, which we'll see in coming chapters, certainly not tonight, but there wasn't enough foliage for these creatures, these huge creatures to survive, particularly in this new Ice Age world, right? In this new world where the band of survivability is much smaller and the foliage and growth is less productive. Um, so it makes sense that even though, again, many things went on the ark, that they would have become extinct fairly quickly which is what we'll get to in our next little section, is that uh, this is part of what makes it difficult to ascertain which animals are being discussed at certain times because there were a lot more, there was a lot more variety of animal life on the earth then than there is now because things were going extinct, right? Uh, as, they, as they did go extinct or continue to go extinct, in fact. And uh, interestingly, has anybody heard of any new life we hear about things going extinct often, but has anybody ever said, well, you know, there wasn't this new kind of rabbit before, but now there is this new kind of rabbit? No, we might have a subspecies, and heaven knows what will happen when they, as they mess with genes and uh, genetics and all the other cloning and all that other terrifying stuff that will surely bring about the end of the world. But by and large, nature is not making new animals by which I mean only God is able to create. And so we see that lessening, not becoming more. Okay. Uh, the frozen deep, of the, or the surface of the deep is frozen. Water's hardened like stone. Oh, my goodness. Okay. So now we get into the stars and the sky portion. Where are we at? Joyce, would you mind reading 31 through, um, make sure I get you right, 33. Can you find the beautiful Pleiades? Can you loose the cords of Orion? Can you bring forth the constellations in their seasons or lead out the bear with its cubs? Do you know the laws of the heavens? Can you set up God's dominion over the earth? Excellent. So <clears throat> now he gets off to the, uh, the celestial world, that is to say the stars and the constellations. And what is he saying? Can you bind the cluster of the Pleiades? Again, just want to point this out, we take this for granted because we're so foolish. We're so foolish. But if it's just a huge chaotic bang, why would you look up and see the same constellations in the sky all the time? Why would they stand all but still for us? Not just over a decade or a lifetime, but, and, and you'll forgive me, I know Orion and then the Great Bear is what we call the Dipper, the Big Dipper. Outside of that, I, I don't know the Pleiades, which one that is. Um, but we, we see these constellations in the sky, and they're still there. Why so much order? So God is asking Job, are you the one holding those, those stars in place? Are you the one who's keeping this, these, these, these uh, lights in the sky right where they're meant to be? Uh, do you know the ordinances of the heavens? Can you set their dominion over the earth? As we uh, look and see, and this is really what we're meant to do, right? Uh, it's why we love watching, whether we know it or not, why we love watching the Discovery Channel or the Nature Channel or whatever it is. We love to watch those things because we're just constantly awestruck and amazed by what God has done in, see in making all these heavenly bodies, these... Uh, planets and stars and asteroids all moving together through and they're constantly out there right now flying around and Halley's Comet is somewhere and you know Jupiter's somewhere and, and there's uh, what is it uh, galaxies beyond the galaxies beyond the galaxies that God created and we'll never see them but they're there and they bring glory some of them are already buried up right it took us 100 million years to get here <laughs> right <laughs> <laughs> ah, the problem of distant we can starlight. See them. <laughs> we can see them. That's right. <laughs> oh my. Oh yes. So, uh, the 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 point being that it is designed to humble us, and it's wonderful to think that God created all of this beauty and wonder and hung it all together, and most of it we'll never see. Like right, as even as we use a telescope, we see can see more in the heavens than we could without one. 
But even then, we're not seeing even a, a fraction of what's there. And you know why God put it there? Well, for his glory. It doesn't matter if we see it or not. It still glorifies him. And there's a small bit of encouragement in that. Because there's lots of infinitesimal and infinitesimally small moments in your life that no one will ever see but bring him glory. And it doesn't matter that no one else sees them. It doesn't matter that the world doesn't take notice. Because just like all those spinning planets and stars that, 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 that would absolutely leave us speechless, but we just don't know they're there. So is the magnificence of the inner world and the inner spiritual life of an individual who chooses to trust Christ once. Now, this is amazing. If, you tru- if a person, a sinner, chooses to trust Christ, we're told that there's rejoicing in heaven. That could be a private moment that no one else saw, but there's rejoicing in heaven. Um, so hopefully it gives us a concept of scope. All right, uh, Nobu. Thank you for 38. Yes, okay. please. Can you raise your voice to the clouds and cover yourself with a flood of water? Do you send the lightning bolts on their way? Do they report to you? Here we are. Who endowed the heart with wisdom or gave understanding to the mind? Who has the wisdom to count the clouds? Who can tip over the water jars of the heavens when the dust becomes hard and the clods of earth stick together? Awesome. Okay, so we need, obviously need, we rely upon the weather cycle. We have no idea what the weather cycle would have been, no idea. We have little idea what the weather cycle was like before the flood, but in this post-flood world, we are constantly counting on water to continue to evaporate and condense and come together and then fall somewhere else on the earth. If that doesn't happen, we are in a heap of deep, right? When we don't get enough rain, it can cause uh, drought, famine, all sorts of other Uh, difficult situations for us. We need the right precipitation at the right time, and we take it for granted that the world usually does that, but it doesn't do that by accident. It does that by design, by God's plan. He made it possible for us to exist in this world, and he's asking him, can you lift up your voice to the clouds and the abundance of water cover you? Can you call down water from the sky? Does everybody... Uh, we're all familiar with the concept of rain dance. My parents used to say, oh, you want it to rain? Go out and do a little rain dance. I don't know why. It's funny because we did. Never worked. Mm-hmm. Never once. And I would argue that it never worked in all of history. Because God is the one who's in charge of the water. And he uses that, right? Can, we can all think of Elijah, right? He said it's didn't, not going to rain for three years. What happens? It doesn't rain for three years. That's catastrophic for the population of Israel, mind you. But God isn't proving how great Elijah is. God's proving that he's the one who's in control of everything. We're going to see the same thing in the tribulation period with the time of the two witnesses. They'll be able to call down great periods of drought anywhere they like on the earth. It's going to be a big deal. It's going to be a certification of their message. However, Job and we (laughs) have no such authority in this world. Uh, we cannot number the clouds. It's, it, imagine that for a moment. The clouds are constantly forming, dissipating. We can't look up and say, oh, is that two clouds or is that one? But God's saying, I know exactly how many clouds there are right now, running count. The same God knows exactly how many hairs are on yours and my head. And it's fascinating because he doesn't just you know, know that because he tries to or wants to. He knows that by default. He literally knows all things. How many atoms are in each hair for that matter? right? There's nothing that's outside of his ultimate omniscience. There's nothing that you could, there's no stumper, there's no riddle that you could ask God. He knows it all. And so he he keeps count of the clouds. He knows where they're moving. Uh, He's involved in their movement. He knows their precise number. And then he he says we can measure out the waters on the earth as we would measure out jars of fluids in our kitchen. Quite a big deal. All right, so I'd like us to stop there. Um, we're going to, I know it's stopping short of this next passage of the, of the chapter 39, but verse 39 kicks into the animals portion and chapter 39 in two, three verses, uh, just continues with animals. So it seems appropriate to pick up in two weeks with, uh, the animals and we'll go through all the, the, the Dr. Doolittle stuff. Just any, uh, closing comments though? What was the value, if we could say that, of God's speech in this time?
weakness, power, authority. Mm -hmm. I think he's just reminding Job of all the stuff he doesn't know. <laughs> well, I, mean, I think that's really profound. I, I, I don't, yeah, that's really, really profound. What don't you know? What don't you and I know about our lives, about what's going on in the world? Like, do you think you know history? Do you realize that you, we can only know what history that has either been invented or made up by people or has been passed down through faithful sources? I mean, every story that we know from history is but one of a million that never got told, right? I'm not trying to disparage and say we can't know history. I'm a great fan of history, but we just have to recognize there's limitations. God could come to us, you know, and, and straighten out and write the ultimate American history and find out that every history we've had is wrong. I don't suspect that would be the case, but you get the point. We need absolute humility before God in every area. And God's trying to point out, like, Job, there's a lot that you don't know. It's pro probably, probably a pretty good thing for us to take into account. Any other? Uh, I was thinking about the Steve Hawkins, what he said. Like, a, a, oh, we don't need your God anymore. Then he could have get rid, gotten rid of God. Yeah. If he could, but I know he's dead now. So I wonder what he's saying. Yeah, I fear to yeah. think. I mean, truly, it, it, I, it's a tragedy. But you're absolutely right. Like, you can. We've had multiple people raise their tiny fist and shake it at God, and it's just tragic to think. You know, Dawkins and Hitchens and all these other people. Uh, it's tra tragic to think that God continues to exist, and here they spend their entire lives hating him, fighting him, resisting him, and claiming not to believe in him all at the same time. Or as one comedian said, who's really crazy? Me, who believes in a God who you don't think exists, or you, who's mad at a God that you don't think you exi exists? <laughs> That's the madness. But yeah, it's a great point. It's a great point. Um, I would argue that you don't have to be suffering, although I'm sure we all are suffering to whatever degree we are. You don't have to be suffering to take this wonderful message to heart. The God who did all that, and it's, it's important to note, right, Job was the direct beneficiary of almost everything that, jo that God mentioned. He said, yeah, you're mad because I took, because he didn't take. You're mad because you lost your stuff. Did you thank me for the sunshine? <laughs> did you thank me for the earth under your feet? Did you thank me for the fact that you have food? Did you thank me for the fact that my cycles, the, the systems that I made, uh, made it possible for you to live and exist this far and experience that? Think it through. Who are you complaining against, right? Who are you complaining against? The one who invented air so that you could breathe it and move your vocal cords. Just keep it in mind. And then remember... That the God who did all that also openly declared that he loves you and that he cares for you. And then when we went astray, he chose to redeem us in the person and work of his son, Jesus Christ. And uh, hopefully that message carries us uh, through. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you so much uh, for your self-revelation, for reminding us who you are. Lord, the fear of the Lord, knowing who you are and who we are in relationship to you. We're not worthy to know you. In our sinfulness and our rebellion and our failures, but you've made yourself known to us. And in your son, Jesus Christ, you've made us acceptable to you in your perfection, your righteousness, and your holiness. Lord, might we stand with wisdom and, and humility before you. Might we worship you and recognize that your glory is truly the center of all our purpose here on earth and the purpose of all the earth. Father, give us wisdom and the ability to glorify you through whatever uh, we might pass, whether that be sufferings and struggles, joys or triumphs. Father, might it all be to your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.